sitting on a panel on uh, data science, big data, um, which will be chaired by uh, Ed Charvet of Trovis. Uh, data science, of course, the process of deriving insight and useful business information uh, that has historically remained hidden in big data. Uh, the panel uh, will debate uh, ways in which small and medium-sized businesses perhaps can benefit from mining their own business data, uh, how they can do this within their budgets, and illustrate examples of data science in operation. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our chairman and panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I think, obviously, we've had quick introductions, but maybe one or two words from everybody just to give a perspective on, on the debate, and then we'll get stuck into some questions. So, Miles, should we? Myself? Yep. Okay. Uh, my name is Miles. I'm a Chief Technical Officer for Blurt, uh, based in Cumbran. We've been going for a couple of years. We do social media um, analytics. Uh, we pull out the conversation. We tell you what people like, what people don't like, what they're angry about, uh, what they're confused about on whatever you like, whatever the social conversation, multiple platforms, Twitter being one of them, uh, Instagram, YouTube, comments, uh, and the like. So we've got um, some experience with big or medium data, as you might say. Uh, so that's where we come in. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, my name's Jane Naylor from the Office for National Statistic, or ONS. Uh, the ONS is the UK's largest producer of official statistics. Uh, we produce statistics on the economy, the society, and the population. And traditionally, these have been based on surveys that we undertake of households and businesses, or the census that we conduct every 10 years, or government administrative data. But what we've been looking at over the last 18 months, I've been leading a research project, is around what other data sources, what big data sources we could use to enhance our statistics and improve government decision making. So, um, and also looking at the technologies and the new analytical techniques that come with that. So, for example, looking at web scraping. So, web scraping price information from supermarket websites and using that data to feed through to our economic indicators. Or looking at things like Twitter, uh, uh, geolocated tweets to look at the movements of the population. So, starting to look at alternative data sources and what the impact they have on official statistics. Good afternoon, my name's Mark. I, I'm the head of analytics research at a defense research organization called Kinetic. Um, for my sins, I also work with the Royal Statistical Society, so I'm particularly passionate about ensuring that statistics get fair representation with the, within the big data uh, community. And um, as part of that, I'm teaching a course at Imperial College, a master's course on the use of uh, statistical methods within big data. So you may hear me bang on today about the use of stats within big data. I'll uh, try and keep it high level. But that's certainly one of my passions in life. Thanks. Very very good. Good. Yeah, is... I think you've all met Conrad. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ed Chave. I'm the uh, business unit director of Logicalis's insight division called Trovus, which was recently acquired by Logicalis. Uh, we work with uh, large uh, organizations and public sector organizations to help them bring intelligence out of the data sources they have. I think um, to get the panel started, clearly a very eminent body of people. But obviously the focus that we need to stick to is the idea for the SME, especially the SME in Wales. So I want to start by asking a very broad question and, and you know, let's take it one at a time. Um, big data is a very, very well used term nowadays. Could you help us give a definition for what you believe big data is, particularly within the context of a small business? Um, as I sort of outlined in my introduction, um, at the ONS we've thought of big data as data sets that we don't currently use, so not surveys, not census, not da data that we don't control. So there's various challenges that come with big data. It might be technical, statistical, as, uh, as Mark's pointed out, ethical, legal, commercial issues. Um, and I, don't, I think the phrase isn't particularly helpful sometimes in that we emphasize the big data because I think there's lots of data sources, um, particularly if we're thinking about small and medium and sized businesses, that it's, it's about getting more out of data. So using new techniques, new technologies to get more insights out of the data. And that might be external data, but actually might be an internal data that we currently hold. I would agree and kind of further that. I, I don't really like the term big data personally. Um, I certainly don't like to try to define it because I think it's context specific. 
Um, what I prefer to do, or what I find constructive, is to um, look at how and why big data as a term has emerged over the past five to ten years. And I think that's a fact, there's kind of three factors um, that have encouraged big data to emerge. The first factor is the instrumentation of pretty much everything within our lives. We've heard many talks today about the Internet of Things, etc. So it's the um, kind of the instrumentation and, and so the availability of data. Uh, the second factor is the interconnectivity of everything, so essentially the kind of internet or the IP backbone that most, if not all, uh, devices are now connected. And, and so be able, the, the ability to transfer data to a centralized repository or even uh, transfer processing uh, to, to the actual device itself. Um, and finally, um, it's, the, um, it's essentially the kind of um, middleware uh, big data platforms that now exist, so things that you may have heard of, such as Hadoop, Spark, Streams, etc., that allow developers such as myself and some of you in the audience to essentially not worry about uh, the complexities of, of uh, developing um, fault-tolerant distributed applications. Uh, the barrier to entry is much lower, so people like myself can now write um, applications that can work at scale, either, either in terms of, kind of um, data volumes or data velocity, if we refer to the four Vs. Thank you, Mark. Oh. Yeah, um, uh, there's not a lot to add to, to that, but I'm glad you opened with uh, Mark that you said you didn't like the term big data because I kind of agree with you. It is banded out a lot um, recently. There's uh, The more academically precise version to me is gigabytes and gigabytes of um, data from multiple, multiple sources, which if we talked about it at length wouldn't really be applicable to SMEs. However, the idea of big data, if you scale it down, what you're doing is you're taking several sources of data, however, however big that is, to your SME, and you can uh, derive from that business intelligence that's going to help you make better commercial decisions, better strategies uh, going forward. It's uh, thing, data you already have, um, customer, customer order books, um, weather, depending on your, your area, really. You can, there's a lot of data you'll have or you can get hold of, put them all together, and they will all tell you they will have some very interesting nuggets of useful information in there. I mean, I'll start a short, I agree that the term is degenerate in all sorts of ways. Uh, I mean, I've heard it said, you know, big data is data where it's cheaper to keep it than to throw it away because of what you can get out of it. Um, I think the big issue, as various people have alluded to, is big analytics, if you want to call it that, is being able to take whatever scale of data, mash it up, and be able to apply all sorts of scales of analytics to it to get answers. And um, I think that's where, that's where the, the cutting edge is and will be for some time. Great. So do, do you think, as a group, then, SMEs are precluded from embracing the scale of data that Conrad was talking about, that, that Jane was talking about, or can they work with their own data sets to get value from? So I, I don't work for an SME, so I can't really comment in an authoritative way, but I believe that tools such as the tools that um, Wolfram are developing, Google developing, and indeed people like Tableau, et cetera, are really lowering the barriers to entry for SMEs, for, for any sized organization, in fact. Um, and, and that's really driving the kind of um, production of value from the data that we traditionally wouldn't have kind of been able to do previously. Yeah, the, the second the attack, there's, um, there's Watson uh, has come on board. Um, there's uh, s small, very um, small licenses for uh, commercial licenses for that, where you just upload um, your spreadsheets. You upload, uh, personally, I don't work for IBM, obviously, but um, you, it, it's interesting that you can um, upload a, a fair amount of unstructured data sometimes and just throw that at the, at the um, system. And, um, and ask it questions, and it might propose might pose questions to you that do you want to know this? Do you want to know that? And was your Wolfram same sort of thing? These um, these technologies are out there, and they're going to help you with your uh, with your businesses. It's just um, that they might be seen as a bit uh, scary, and uh, but they're not. They're 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 getting easier and easier to use, uh, as we've been saying. I think one thing I'll add is, I mean, a lot of the things that have tripped small companies up in working with these things is just the plumbing. You know, the plumbing is difficult and awkward and you need a big sysadmin. That's coming, that's getting much, much better. 
cloud implementation for things is much better. I mean, some of the things we can do now, we can just pump apps straight out with a single line of code. And there it is, on the cloud, or you can have a private cloud. These things were not possible even a year ago. Some of these we're just rolling out now. Uh, and you know, we've had technology that would sort of allow that kind of thing for a long time if you had a whole setup to support it. But it's much smoother. And, and again, it's, it's one of these back to my interface point. In the end, the interface to how you do these things becomes crucial because you know, it's just like iPhones, right? When iPhones came out, they didn't actually have the technology in that was much greater than the Nokias that preceded them. But the fact is you could use them because the interface and the workflow actually worked. And I think that's a lot of what needs fixing in some of what's happening. And that's a lot of what will immediately and is already improving life for SMEs uh, with, with data. So I think the message is yes. I think it's you know, fairly early days for SMEs with the sort of these technologies. But it's getting better every, every day of the week. And I think often SMEs actually have sort of insights and abilities to problem solve in their area better than some of the larger companies that are kind of more stuck in the mud in being able to handle those things. Yeah, I, I just add the point that, I mean, coming from a, a, um, the Office for National Statistics, you know, IT government departments aren't known for having huge sort of very flexible IT systems. Um, but something we've done at, at the ONS is set up something that um, we've called our innovation labs. So they're an environment uh, which is separate, um, completely separate to the ONS network um, for security reasons. Um, but it allows staff to play with some of these technologies, to use all open source software, programming languages. And it's providing that kind of environment that people can then can start to understand these technologies and play with them using open data sources. So it's providing that kind of environment. It's definitely getting more flexible and more accessible. Great. Thank you. And you know, the, for my, to my mind, if the technology is making the potential for access readily available, does an SME need to have a, have a Conrad or a Jane in their midst, the data scientist or a Mark or a Miles, or can they find other people in their organization to access it? Are we breaking down the barriers to the human connection so the individual can make use of it in an SME environment? OK, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> it's been handed to me. Um, gosh, I mean, Look, we're all underpowered. You know, I've got a maths degree, but I feel underpowered in problem solving for the modern world with the modern technology we have. So everybody could step up at every level. Um, it depends what you're trying to do and as to whether you kind of need, you know, how higher powered human you need. I mean, what's really happening is what the computer can do with less human help, so to speak, is getting better and better. But at the same time, what we're expecting to get done in terms of analyzing data we have is going up at the same point. And so it sort of depends critically on what industry you're in and what you're trying to achieve as to which of those kind of goes up faster and therefore how much expertise you need. I mean, in general, just like people need expertise now in handling their computer, you, know, you can't get a job really of any seriousness without knowing something about how to at least use your computer, you kind of need to know how to use data science in some sense. But the, the extent to which you need that depends on the detail of what you're doing, I think. One of the reasons that uh, we're embracing the kind of government's um, SME agenda is that SMEs in general bring, um, if we collaborate with enough of them, bring the multidisciplinary team that is needed to be able to solve the problems that our customers, Kinetics customers, are facing. And so it's that collaborative nature um, between organizations, between um, individuals within organizations that actually drives uh, the value out of data and, and one individual in isolation, as Conrad points out, probably doesn't have all of the requisite knowledge to be able to extract all of the value from the data and, and indeed pass that across to the person that's making the decision. And so, yeah, collaboration is key, really. Yeah, to be um, a bit flippant, you could kind of make the point, well, um, a small business doesn't need a data scientist role that you, as small medium businesses, don't need to, after this talk, go out and get a data scientist right away. Um, but in the same way that uh, the larger your company, the more specialized roles you get, I think, if you think about it, you, you do a certain amount of data analysis um, in your businesses most days. You look at a spreadsheet of figures and say, well, this is what this spreadsheet uh, does. But the more these data scientists role uh, skills kind of feed down into businesses, um, 
the more your accountants can say, well, instead of looking at um, your salespeople, instead of looking at the raw figure straight in front of me, I'm actually going to pull in these other data sources and see what is affecting those sales, see if it's to do with the weather, which is open source intelligent out there, um, and, and pull in a variety of other things. So I think the more businesses are aware how easy this is to do, the more these skills will actually start to creep in, just as you know, computer expertise has crept into all our businesses, um, it will sort of evolve. Yeah, um, yeah I'd, I'd sort of echo the, the, the comments around it sort of being a bit of a team sport, um, data science. At, at the ONS, we decided not to try, go out and recruit sort of data scientists, but actually look at the people we already had in the organization. And my research team is based uh, made up of both statisticians and IT experts, and it's about bringing them together in a team environment, that inv innovative environment, giving them the right tools and the right training, and developing that capability together. And then, like you were saying, uh, working with the rest of the business and the organization to disseminate those skills as well. I agree. Just, I, just one yeah, little thing sorry. to add, because I thought of it while others were speaking. Uh, I do think Brits are not bad problem solvers. It's a huge generalization. But I think societally, we're not bad at the base skills you need to be able to look around corners and figure out what to do, the sort of skills you really do need for data science. If we can tether those, to, as I was talking about, maths and coding, it's kind of like we give it the, the structure that it needs to attach those two. I think we can really do very well, and do well against some of the people who do well in the PISA scores, the education scores around the world. You know, some of the countries that do well in what I would call the procedural skills of maths and so forth, I think we can do, in fact, much better if only we can adjust, play on the right playing field and the right game. Yeah, I, I, I think the only thing I'd add to I don't know if the facilitator's allowed to have an opinion on these things, but. Uh, um, that team aspect of it is very important and the one thing that I didn't hear any of you mention which I believe is very important is the, the, the non-data person who can ask the right commercial questions because uh, I've seen a lot of time organizations invest a lot of time and effort to chase the beauty of the exploration of the data rather than defining the commercial outcome realistically so I think that's that's very much in that part okay um, I'm going to open up to the floor in a few minutes, so we'll do a couple more questions up here, so please do get your, your thoughts together. Um, Jane, you talked about the, 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 the creative environment you're trying to create in the ONS. Creativity for me, when you're looking at data and the exploration of data to try and define an outcome is a very important part. Would you guys give us a, a view on how you think creativity can be brought into the process or what you see happening around it? Um, well, I mentioned sort of creating the right environment um, for innovation um, and creativity. Um, something else that uh, has been mentioned in a number of um, talks today, um, and Mark sort of mentioned earlier, is about partnerships and collaboration. So getting more people involved, so thinking outside of your organisation, um, are there other private sector organizations, other people within academia that you can get involved in your projects. Um, it's something that we've done quite a lot of um, at the ONS, working with other government departments, working with other statistical organizations, working with academics, and bringing kind of di different aspects, different views of the same kind of problems. And I think that helps in order to create, um, to enhance creativity. Mark? I mean, I can just add, I mean, I think it's creativity and, I mean, I don't know, creativity in various ways and skepticism of what you're told, mm. right? I mean, what I think, I agree completely with your point about, I mean, in my four-step maths thing, one of the biggest problems is people ask the wrong questions. And they ask the wrong questions, it doesn't matter what they work out, they end up pretty typically with the wrong answer. And, but it's hard to build it up. I mean, you know, one of the things I realize is that from doing lots of maths and looking at data a lot, you get some sort of feeling for whether something, you know, does it smell right or does it smell wrong? And, it, you know, it happens if you take, you know, this country, you know, Britain, for example, you know, we're quite skeptical on politics, perhaps too much so sometimes, and there's sort of, you know, because of a certain feeling of history, you can tell a little bit what, whether you believe something or don't believe something, whether you think something's going right or wrong in some way. We don't have that inbuilt in education for data and for maths, and we should. And I think that's crucial. And you're right, even if you don't, kind of maths is important in just knowing what the feeling is. You know, and, and when I was told in the banking crisis that you know, senior managers thought that risk had been eliminated by maths, 
you know, your alarm bells go off and you think, I don't know what the exact numbers are that are in there. There's something wrong with this, right? It's like being told you built a perpetual motion machine. And people should, at a highly you know, people should be educated to understand what those skeptical points are. And that's part of the creativity, not the only part, of course. Yeah. Agreed. Very good. Thank you. Mark, anything on that? Mark? Uh, I'd just refer back to my previous answer, really, in terms of collaboration. So one of the things I've been trying to do today um, is to go and visit as many of the different um, stalls downstairs um, that are outside of my typical domain of expertise, uh, just to try to get some um, kind of sparks of um, inspiration, if you like, um, to be able to take back to the office and, um, and understand how I can apply them in the context of the problems that I'm trying to solve. So it's, it's the collaborative aspects, and it's also this um, multidisciplinary nature that allows us to, um, to, to retain that creativity, in my opinion. I'll just add, um, a certain amount of creativity and a bit of an inquisitive nature would always help when doing this, uh, when doing data analysis. If you think about it, you're going to combine several, several data sources. It takes a bit of a creative, inquisitive mind to go, well, what happens if I put that with that? What happens with what? And you'll see um, some interesting points that wouldn't come out um, if you just looked at data and said, there we go, there. I'll accept that for what it is. Um, so maybe that touches a bit more on the creativity point. Very good. And then, <clears throat> just briefly, you know, we've already, Conrad's already touched on education a couple of times. I mean, from my perspective, I've seen the first generation of BI graduates emerging from universities this year. We've got one. And uh, it's very interesting to see how well equipped they are to come and, 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 join, and join in the commercial world. Do, do you think education is doing enough to support this as a discipline? Said my piece on this. <laughs> so, um, that's a very good question. Um, there are numerous courses that are starting that I've seen throughout um, the world on data science, and they're all taking a slightly different approach. So we focus on data science as a discipline. I think it's not very well understood, and it's not the value that people are trying to get out of data science as a discipline is um, is different in the different contexts under which it's being kind of applied. So education could be improved at the university level, in my opinion, um, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a journey that we're on. We're all trying to understand data science collectively. And, um, and as we apply data science as a discipline uh, to the problems that we're facing, then we'll kind of evolve to a, a better state than we're in today. Mark, Mark, before we move on, given your perspective on it, do you think the wider education establishment understands what data science actually is as opposed to maths or statistics or anything else? Um, uh, well, I generalize massively. So there will be people within uh, academia that do truly understand that. Um, Generally speaking, I think um, the academics could interact with um, industry a bit more to be able to um, optimize the courses that they're giving out in the, in the area of data science specifically. Um, I was just going to add that so on to that point that is a responsibility for all of us as potential employers uh, of new graduates to work with academics. So where new courses are being set up, I know um, from my work working with a number of universities, they're keen to get real life examples and projects um, from industry that the students can work on rather than theoretical examples. So I think that we can do our bit by supporting the universities. I mean, and it's an excellent way of interacting with new graduates um, to getting sort of their new um, skills applied to problems, um, you know, sponsoring PhDs, um, taking on placement students. So I think we can help shape what uh, the new courses are as well, and there's a res responsibility on us as employers. Very good. Miles, in? No? Okay. Right, uh, we've got a few more, but let's go to the floor. Are there any questions out on the floor? Yes, I can see one at the back. Hello. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation, Conrad. I'm, I'm a big fan for a long time. Very fascinating. Thank you for that. My question is, we have these new technologies, and they are getting easier to use, but our human cultural context within our organizations are really the main impediment.
edge that are kind of creating this moment of insight that allows us to break free from our current containment of our traditional mental models? Gosh, that's a hard one to answer, although I agree with the, the tenor of the question. Um, I mean, look, I'll tell you the biggest inspiration, I, and I've said this a few times, for us over the years we've built stuff, and I think we're a pretty innovative company, uh, was Jobs. I mean, Steve Jobs came up with the name Mathematica and was very involved at various points along our history. And Jobs was a guy where basically, uh, you know, it was all interdisciplinary. He didn't care where it came from. He was very incisive. And I think incisiveness is actually a key skill that we don't have. How we generate that in people, I'm not sure. I think part of it is confidence. I mean, one of the things I've seen certainly with maths and other things around maths is, you know, if I'm given something to read, some technical thing, some piece of data science or something, some, some, something describing something, I'm arrogant enough to believe that basically if I can't, you know, if I put a significant amount of effort in and I really can't understand it, there's something wrong with it. And most people don't have that because they don't have the push, they don't have the confidence to know that that might be the case. So they, basically they get bullshitted half the time. And that's a bad start because I think then what happens is people see all these things and it doesn't produce real answers and decisions and they get confused and then they think it was them that was confused and so forth. So I think there's a lot of confidence building we need to do. I think there's a lot of things where you need clarity over what the answer is you're looking for and that will help to drive back into what people's understanding is and then they can kind of see the patterns. But this isn't a very complete answer, I think, to your, to your question. I mean, I think, um, um, you know, a lot of times, people like to take some sort of middle road. And I think the jobs example is don't do that. And I think there are eras when that works. And I think data science now is an era where you've got to plow forward to very new things. There'll be a time when that's not the case for data science. But right now, I think it is. Thank you. Yeah. Again, back to the, uh, on, on the SME point, um, one of the barriers to using these tools, I think, is education, Pe uh, knowing that this sort of thing is possible um, once companies are aware uh, of how easy this is to do and how powerful it can be, just let capitalism do the rest because their competitors will say, hang on, how are they doing so well? Well, these, there's these tools and these, uh, these widgets uh, that can help us out and yeah. it'll go from there, I think. I, I, I would certainly add, I mean, when you listen to someone like Conrad speak, you understand what the idea of stretching oneself really is all about. But there is a large middle in the industrial engine of any country which just needs to make progressive steps to yeah. catch up with someone like you. And I think it's very important that they don't lose sight of that. Um, you know, it's a fascinating to see the sort of organizations we work with and the, the importance of the questions they're answer, asking, which are so seemingly simple and so commercially important to them. Mark, to, to add, or Jane, anything else to add? Actually, I'll, I'll just add, you know, um Actually, no. Carry on. Okay. Any other easy. questions on the floor? Yes, one down here. Hi, my name is Simon Jones from Hoyle Limited. I'm based at Welsh Ice, which we've heard about a bit today, which is an excellent thing. I'd say, first of all, about the collaboration aspect of things. At Welsh Ice, we've got um, butterfly developments. We've also got Profit Sorcery, who I'd be able to give details to you afterwards that may be able to help. But I'm just wondering, is not digital 2015 the start of all this? Because I, as a business person, setting out on my own, knew nothing about big data before I came to collaboration or came to this. So sorry, what's your question? The question is, um, in respect of that, do you think that informational things like this, do you think that the ordinary SME has any chance of taking hold of big data to use it in the proper way? Okay. So is, is big data accessible to your common or garden SME, which is the engine of any country, right? Anybody want to have a go at that? Well, I was just uh, going to say, hopefully after this, yes, uh, hopefully this is the education point, uh, you know, disseminating this information and expertise. Um, hopefully this is part of the process. There's a slight irony here in that we could use data science to be able to identify individuals such as yourself who may benefit from big data technology. Um, so, so maybe that's something that I'll consider as a kind of internal project to, to, to widen my customer base. And I think you know, one of the key themes coming out of this, this session is around collaboration and that's exactly what can start happening at, at conferences like this, making networks, making those connections, so yeah. 
Yeah, and I would say, you know, to Conrad's point about interface, uh, if, the, if the data scientists who are stretching to reach to the boundaries are the ones who are breaking down the barriers to the data and making it accessible for everybody else, that's exactly the role that we should play. And it's the access through the interface which is the important part. Any other questions? Very good. Well, I think we are now up at time, so I would like to thank... Oh, well, one sorry, more. have we got time for one more? One more. I said yeah, yes. Yeah, it's a bit of a challenge, really. Um, if we take, go back to the SME debate, and um, I guess one of the problems, or one of the major problems in SME has, he, he, they probably have a spend against all the, the, the business lines which a medium or a large scale enterprise will have, but they don't have the scale behind it. Um, uh, one of the things that was coming across here is the science. So to make this a, a, a point of access for uh, SMEs, surely you should be taking the science out of it and talking about anal about analytics and analysis as a service. Uh, so I don't, I don't really want maths as a service. I know that maths is the enabler uh, of the solution. And there's, as you mentioned, there's things like Tableau, Hadoop, and there's um, providers who provide analytics, etc., as a service. So, so I guess my question to the panel is, can you take science out of the, the equation? So uh, can I phrase it one more way as well? So you want answers. You don't want to spend the time considering. No, I think if you, if, you, if you talk about, the more you talk about data science and the data scientists can do X, Y, and Z, you, the taller the barrier becomes. Okay. So the play is a very good question. The place I always start with my customers is what's the, um, uh, what's the intelligence value that they're trying to extract from the um, data? What are the questions that they're trying to ask? and start really from, from the interface point of view, how are we going to get that intelligence value across to them, and that drives everything else. So the, so the science, if you like, comes last uh, when we're interacting with um, end users, and, and, and that needs to remain key, and Conrad's points during his presentation um, kind of reinforce that, I guess. Well, maybe this spawns a new industry of uh, business consultancy, people that come into your business and say, well, let's plug in all your bits of data, we'll do the data, data science bit, and do it for you just because the barrier to entry is much lower because of the technology. So perhaps, if, if that's what you mean, rather than your business do that, yeah, perhaps this um, is the start of a new, uh, a new industry. And in fact, we've been doing exactly that because we are traditionally a technology company and we've been doing increasing amounts of consulting for helping people, large or small, to get going. Often they want to actually eventually learn how to do the things, but they may not want to get started that way. And in particular, the alpha technology, which does linguistics, uh, we've had a huge number, mostly larger companies with that, because it, it's quite hard to get, get started with that. You, know, you have to do quite a lot of work. But where we've had, for example, pharmaceuticals and things saying, we've done these drug trials, and we'd really like to know how to linguistically you know, ask what happens in these different cases. So kind of a private instantiation of that public Siri, Apple, and, and our alpha service. Um, I think that, you know, like all of these things, there's a certain amount of expertise you need to build up in-house, and there's a certain amount that you can buy in, and it's always a question as to whether you, you know, do you buy in, do you, do you hire people, you know, we hire electricians to deal with our building because we don't have in-house electricians. Um, that's a decision point, whereas there are other things where we do have an in-house service for it, and you have to decide how central it is to your business as to whether you want that. I would say that understanding how to look at data, I think, is becoming sort of a very intrinsic skill. It's like, you know, most CEOs can write their own emails now, I would hope. Uh, most CEOs need to be able to actually be able to understand and ask the skeptical questions of data. They may not need to be able to write all the code, but they need to probably be able to write some code. And I, increasingly, we're seeing CEOs who can actually do some of the analysis, but it depends on the industry and it depends what the background is and so forth. But I think the overall level will slowly climb with external and internal resources to aid that. Very good. And I was just going to add a point that, that Mark made right at the beginning about his sort of passion um, as a statistician myself. I think that as well as um, getting kind of external people uh, in to, to support business, it's also useful to have that knowledge in-house. Quite often when we're talking about these data sources, they're quite messy, they're quite biased, so we need kind of analysts, and that's why um, kind of things, uh, groups like the Royal Statistical Society are very passionate about big data. So it's about getting the right balance of analysts involved with this work. Great. All right. I think we'll call it 
quits there. But thank you very much to our four panellists.